that, Brother Will. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 12. I've been in this text now for some time with the Lord, and He just continues to give me things out of this passage on how to strengthen my walk with Him to be a stronger, uh, more fulfilled Christian, one who lives a fulfilled life, I mean, here on this earth, not just living, waiting for that rapture as so many Christians do today. Uh, We ought to be living a full life, one that's full of joy and one that's full of servitude, uh, reaching the lost people around us. That's our call. That's our command from our God in heaven. And so I've been seeking ways that I can better improve uh, my life and be more aware of the time that passes by and the things that are going on around me and trying to make certain that I tie up those loose ends so that I can be used a vessel of God and hear those wonderful words one day, Thou good and faithful servant. Here in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter number 12 is where we're at, but we're going to go back and we're going to read one verse here. Uh, This is the same message I preached uh, a couple nights ago, uh, Friday night, if you uh, watched. The reason I quit sharing are you is because I know some of you do watch that. And uh, oftentimes, if not every time, um, the Lord's, I'm working on a message when Brother Hayes asked me to preach for RU, and so, uh, so every time so far, it's been exactly a perfect message for Reformers Unanimous, and it works uh, for the church as well. And so we're back here in Second Chronicles chapter number 12, and I'm hoping this morning as we leave out of here that we'll find a way to stabilize our walk with Christ. Uh, most of the Christians in today's time, in this day and age, at least in our country, are up and down as Christians. They're, one moment they're living a life of victory. They seem to be seeing God bless their life and they can praise Him with both hands. And just the very next day, the next moment, they find themselves in this great, great despair, just wondering where God is as He's forsaken them, uh, wondering if they're even saved. This roller coaster of Christianity is a result of our actions, not God. He is faithful and just. He will keep us. No man will pluck him, uh, us out of his hand. He said that he'll, uh, uh, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We can be confident in that very thing. So if we're experiencing the up and downs of Christianity in this life, it's because of some things in our own life that need to be uh, searched out. Some of our own uh, responsibilities need to be check, uh, taken into consideration and, and put in check, if you will, so that God can have full power and control over us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse number 14 is where uh, we want to come to in conclusion, but we'll start there and then we'll backtrack a few chapters to see all that takes place here for Rehoboam and the things concerning Israel and Judah. The Bible says in verse number 14, and he did evil, speaking of Rehoboam, and he pre- because he prepared not his heart, to seek the Lord. Our God, we come to you this morning. Now I ask you, Father, to help us to listen intensely, to listen to every word, Lord God, from your word. I pray, Father, that you'd speak to us and embolden us. And Lord God, I pray that you'd convict us where needed, encourage and uplift those who need that as well. And God, I pray that you would have preeminence in this hour, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we step into this 12th chapter, we need to turn back a couple pages uh, or a page or so and, to, and begin to look really where Rehoboam comes on the picture as the king. At the start of chapter number 10 and verse number 1, you find where he now is going to take the throne. He steps in where his daddy, Solomon, uh, left so oft. He, Solomon is now passed on. Rehoboam is coming on the scene. He's going to, uh, as the Bible says, and Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem where all Israel come to make him king. As he arrives on the scene, he's going to be made king. He comes to Shechem. He has been looking forward to this day all his life, and now's the time to take over the kingdom. He's looking forward to what he gets to do. And just like so many Christians will look at Rehoboam as a picture of us. He is a representation of us today, uh, knowing, of course, uh, the things that are transpiring here in Second Chronicles. Uh, but we're going to utilize uh, his life and compare it to our own. And hopefully when we walk out these doors, we'll find a recipe to help us not be in such a roller coaster state of Christianity. It's my desire that this church be on fire for God, not sometimes, not most of the time, but all the time, always with a zeal and a hunger for souls to be saved. That's my passion and my zeal. That's my desire. If you're around me very long, you you soon learn that just about the only thing I ever preach on is getting people saved. 
because that's what the gospel of Christ is. He saved me from hell, and we ought to go tell the world that he can save them from hell. In the first verse of chapter number 10, we find Rehoboam uh, stepping on the scene to become king, and it's only a few uh, verses later we find that as he arrives on the scene to become a king, He makes a good choice. We're going to see a few good choices by Rehoboam, and we're going to see a few that really uh, are just not too good. Look, if you would, at verse number, uh, well, let's let's just continue on. Uh, Verse number 2, And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was in Egypt, whether he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. And they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous, Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us and we will serve thee. Can I stop right there before we go any further and say this? Jeroboam is coming up out of Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world. It's a picture of the things of this world. And Here Jeroboam is coming up out of Egypt. He shouldn't have been down there in the first place, but he's coming to seek a lighter load. He's coming to look for something to help him, to ease him. And and, and, uh, Rehoboam has a chance right here to unite all of Israel and Judah. And he's going to do the right thing. His very first thing that he's going to do is he's going to seek counsel, as we're going to see in verse number 6 from the old men. Look at the Bible. It says, And he said unto them, Come again after me three days. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give you me to return answer to this people? Now, the old men are going to answer him. Now, uh, keep in mind, keep in consideration that these old men are the men who served under Solomon. I mean, these men have seen the greatest king. The Bible says he was the wisest man to ever live. And they're seeing, uh, these, young, these old men have seen this man live out life. And, and the Bible tells us, Solomon tells us, that he tried everything under the sun. Boy, he went to testing everything he was told. He's kind of like me. I'm a little hard-headed. And so if you tell me something's going to hurt me, I'm going to try it out to see if it'll hurt me. Solomon did the same thing. Solomon, the Bible says he tried out everything. He wanted to find out to make sure that it was true what was said about it. And so he could confidently say this and this about anything. These men gave counsel to Rehoboam, a young man who's come on the scene, a king, and they've given him counsel concerning things of this life and this world and things that he's wanting to know the answers to. For instance, shall I uh, uh, lighten the load of the people? (coughs) Excuse me. These, these men, in verse number 7, the Bible says, they answered him this way, and they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and will and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. Well, these old men, they've been through it. They've seen all things. Solomon, you know, as we read according to scriptures and, and even other historic accounts, uh, books written about Solomon, give uh, credence to other people came from all over the world, kings and princes, queens and uh, princesses. They came to seek his wisdom. They wanted to know what Solomon knew. And these men are now passing on some of the things that they learned from Solomon. Now, Rehoboam is no stranger to Solomon's words. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs was recorded, and oftentimes in the book of Proverbs, as Solomon's speaking, he says, My son, give attendance to. My son, hear me. My son, listen. He, he, over and over again, he says, My son, he's speaking to his children. He's speaking to Rehoboam. But now Rehoboam is listening, not only forgetting what his father said, but now Rehoboam is listening to what these old men are saying concerning the affairs before him. And they hear him, but yet he's not going to heed their warnings. Now, before I jump any further, I might say that it would be wise for the church today to listen to the senior saints of yesterday concerning the matters of the church. There is no new thing under the sun. And these old timers that are sitting in our pews today, they've got some wisdom concerning the affairs of this life and concerning the matters of the church. And there's a generation of preachers out there that are preaching uh, 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 something that's not even Bible in my, uh, as far as I'm concerned. They're trying to find new way, ways to get people in the door, trying to reach these young people. The truth of the matter is the old paths still work. And if you ask the senior saints, they'll tell you, stick to the word, stick to God's message, and that's all we need to grow the church and to reach the young people and there's truth in that now Rehoboam comes on the scene and and as we just read their advice to him was listen be kind to him 
I could say this, there's, there's preachers of all different calibers, there's some that preach with power, there's some that are more teachers, and they all uh, reach a certain group of people, and I'm, I'm thankful for God for all of them, but there are some preachers out there that don't speak kindly, and they weigh people down, and they press with a heavy thumb, just as Rhea Bohm is going to do here, and if they'd have taken the advice of these old timers and just loved people and showed people that Jesus Christ loved them and died for them, they might be willing to unify and not hate God so much. Again, this is a picture, there's an illustration to be found here concerning our day and age. Real Bowen, I saw a picture of some of the things that I was in, in ministry, uh, and even and just as a saved person, there's ups and downs in my life until I found out some of the things that Real Bowen uh, was able to, uh, he didn't get it corrected as we'll see, but he, there was things in his life that was very comparative to mine. And if we'll listen today, I'm certain that God will help us to understand. Look at it, it says in verse number 8. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men. Well, that doesn't seem very smart. You go asking a young guy what to do and how to do it. He's got no idea. If you go on any job very long, uh, I remember I did a lot of landscape and heavy equipment operation and uh, was working with a lot of landscape and crews and construction crews and boy them young guys they, they just love to tell you how to get the job done and well you, you get around them and boy, they're just now this is how you do it you're doing it the wrong way now their way gets it done quickly but by the end of the project whether it's construction or whether it's landscaping if you did it their way there'd be a lot of loose ends a lot of things that didn't quite look good I mean they got the job done but it wasn't to perfection like I like it well I learned a long time ago if you go to the old timers they know all the tricks that actually work. They don't know all the things. They learned a long time ago that it's better to work smarter than to work harder. And you'll learn from them little tricks that will help you along the way. And it may take a little bit longer, but when it's done, it's done the way it's supposed to be done. Here, Rehoboam is going, he's going to seek some advice from some young men. He says, uh, took counsel in verse number 8 with the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. That tells me right there that he was looking for people that were going to tell him what he wanted to hear. Uh, and I haven't even got into the message yet to the, to the meat of it. Matter of fact, we haven't even got to the first five points of the introduction. But I'll say this uh, concerning this man. When you find people that are only looking for yes men, when you're looking for people that are going to tell you what you want to hear, you better watch out. I know a lot of Christians that are no longer in the pews today. They're out there in the world. They once sat in the, under good, solid preaching, but they made up their mind that they were going to find things to dispute what the preacher was preaching, and they determined in their own heart that they were going to follow after that, and they would find any preacher they could online that would preach and say what they believed. And they'd say, see, this guy says it this way. That's not what the Bible says. I hear that a lot with the, the, the alcohol and the consuming alcoholic beverages. Everybody will go find a preacher that, that says it's okay to drink. But I'm going to tell you, well, I don't need to get back on that rabbit trail. I've been harping on that long enough, amen. We'll continue on. Verse number 9, And he said unto them, What vice give ye that we may return answer to this people, which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that thy father put upon us. And here's what the young men say in verse number 10, and this is where we find our first point of our introduction, the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. I want you to notice, number one, his little finger, his finger. He says, uh, they said this, Thou shalt say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now the loins are that lower part of the back where the, the backbone is the thickest and the boldest. It's that section from the hips to the false ribs. That It's about a, a few inches tall, about five, maybe four, five, six inches in, in, in uh, height. And it's just that part of the meat there, the thickest part of the backbone. What he's saying here is my little finger is going to be so heavy, it's going to be heavier than the strongest, thickest part of my daddy's back. You ever heard somebody, that guy's got a backbone. Well, he, Rehoboam says, they're going to fear me because my finger is going to weigh them down. Even the smallest task I give them is going to be too great a burden for them. And my dear friends, there's some preachers out there. There's some men who have stood in the pulpit, who have uh, stood in the Sunday school rooms, and they've preached a gospel that's burdensome. They've preached a gospel that's against what Jesus said, for he said that his yoke is light. He said that his yoke is easy. 
Jesus did not say it'll be burdensome. He did not say that it'll be more than you can handle, but there's been a people that have, have stood over churches and lorded over them and have scattered the sheep. And there's warnings in the Bible to those men, but there are people that have emptied our church houses in America. And I believe it's, this is the why our churches are struggling to convince them to come back in because there were some men who like Rehoboam got into power and they shouldn't have been there. And they said, my little finger, I don't care what the old timer said, my little finger is gonna be thicker than my father's thigh. I'm going to rule and reign over this church and you're going to do what I say. I don't care what God says. That's hurt some people. And can I tell you today, if that's you, if you've been hurt by some false teaching or some heavy preachers or some heavy people that have lorded over you and it's hurt you spiritually I'm talking about, because there's plenty of those in the workplace too. I'm talking about spiritually this morning. If that's you, if you've encountered some people that have hurt you, I want you to know something. That's not God's way. And if you'll let God Take those things, those feelings, those, that bitterness or whatever might be inside you. If you'll let him have it, if you'll let him uh, take that thing and renew you, I can promise you, you can be used in the rest of your years to serve God, to serve him faithfully and find the joy of being a Christian even in 2021. Some people uh, uh, live in as though, boy, it's just a scary world out there. I- I'm not afraid one bit. The darker the night, the brighter the light. And I'm the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. He's the light of the world. And through me, he shines. I get to take the gospel to the world. And now in 2021, I'm going to see more people saved than I've ever seen before because it's getting darker and darker. And I'm excited about what's ahead. But uh, we find, first of all, his finger. Sin is heavy. That finger represents sin. Can I tell you this morning, the reason, if you're going through the ups and downs of Christianity, the reason for that is because sin that you keep dabbling with, though it may seem small like a little finger, it's a very heavy thing in your life. You don't realize how heavy it is. But the, the fact of the matter is, some sin, well, all sin is pleasurable for a season, but some of that sin is going to last a lifetime. The effects of that sin will last a lifetime. I bear in my body, just as Paul said, the marks. There's things in me, uh, there's, there's things that, that, that have happened to me before salvation that I still, I, I wake up in pain. As, as young as I am, there's a lot of pain in my body. I went to the doctor this past week, and he told me on a scale from 1 to, nine, uh, one to 10 for my, my, my spine, it's messed up uh, 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 at a 9 for my age. It's, it's that bad off. Why? Because of the, the sin that happened early. I'm convinced of it. It was the sin in my life early on. It ain't going to stop me one bit. I'm not worried about it. God will give me the strength and, and the ability to go on. And when, when things begin to slow down, I'll find a new way to serve him. But can I tell you this? Sin is heavy. David could testify to this. When the prophet Nathan came in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and he comes before and he says, Thou art the man. He gives him a little illustration and David gets mad. And he says, what are you doing? Uh, go deal with that man. Take care of him. This, uh, Nathan points his finger at, at David and says, thou art the man. And then it goes on to say that the sword of the word of the Lord, the sword will never depart out of thy house. David's sin lasted him a lifetime. And the effects, the things that followed, they were much, they seemed like a little finger. He was the king. It was, it was no big thing. You know, he didn't really kill Uriah. You know he didn't do that. In, in his mind, he didn't think he was murdering Uriah. He said, just pull back, it's war. You know, they killed him. I didn't kill him. That's not how God saw it. And that little finger began to weigh down heavy upon David's life. And it became so heavy that it began to affect his reign as king. And even then, can I tell you this as an encouragement so you don't get too overcome by that weight, that little finger that's maybe in your life? David became a man that God said was a man after his own heart. So it's not too late to fully turn back to God, to to give everything to God and trust him that he can use you no matter what you've been through and where you've gone in your life. We see, number one, in introduction, his, um, his finger. We see, number two, in verse number 13 and 14, his folly. He comes in verse number 12, so Jeroboam and all the people came. This is day number three has passed, and now they come again on the third day, the Bible says, in verse number 13, and the king answered them roughly. Well, that wasn't how the old men told him in verse number seven. But he says, and he answered them roughly, and King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them 
after the advice of the young man, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereunto, My father chasteneth you with whips, but I will chasten you with scorpions. Uh, you know, his folly was that he simply lacked good sense. That's what that word folly means, lack good sense. It means uh, uh, foolishness. He acted foolishness. He stuck out his chest and thinks he can handle the problems. So many of us think that we can handle the problems that come to us in this life. Rather than falling to our knees and asking God to give us strength and give us wisdom, who, by the way, he says he gives to all men liberally, lost and un, uh, unsaved, he'll give you the wisdom if you seek after it. But here, he, his folly is that he just, I got this. <laughs> Step aside, old timers, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this. And he steps into this folly, he steps into this foolishness, and he finds himself in a position where he's acting more like the devil than the God of Israel. You say, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is Jesus forgives us of our sins. And he washes us white as snow. And, and in, our, in our Reformers Unanimous, we have a principle that says, if you accept the guilt, God will, uh, uh, if you accept the blame, God will remove the guilt. If you, if you accept the blame for your actions, God will remove the guilt that's there. But see, that's not how the devil works. The devil likes to take that guilt and keep coming back to you and say, you remember when you did that? You're no good for another. You can't serve God. You can't be at peace with God. Think about what you did last night when nobody's around and you picked up that telephone. He keeps coming back and he keeps weighing you down. He keeps, that's, that's what the devil does. And this is how Rehoboam does. He says, I'm going to, look at the end of verse number 14. He says, I'm going to ch chastise you with scorpions. You know, and my, my remembrance back to the time that I studied out scorpions in the Bible and just thinking about the scorpion itself, and it, it injects a poison. It's this little tiny creature, and down in Alabama they had some. I remember when we moved down to Alabama as a little boy, and I'm downstairs, and my, my bedroom was down. It was a split level. Uh, it was kind of like a basement uh, down under the ground part of the room, and, and it was cold down there, so it was a place for insects. And I had this nice bedroom, and I thought, man, this is awesome. I got this big old bedroom, and before too long, here comes a scorpion across the ground. Never seen one in my life. Well, I get down there to play with it, and that thing whipped around and stuck me in the finger. And I got introduced to what a scorpion is. See, it hurts right away. When that little tail flings and, and sticks you, it hurts. But it's the venom that causes the damage that begins to hurt the nerves and that pain begins to last for longer and the swelling happens and you don't soon forget getting stung by a, a scorpion. Rehoboam saying, listen, my, my daddy, boy, he, he chastised you, it says in verse 14, he chastised you with whips. That little sting of the whip, it left a little mark there. But what I'm going to chastise you with, it's going to keep stinging you and keep hurting you and keep affecting you down the way. You know, that sounds an awful lot like sin. And sin comes into your life and you may not uh, uh, recognize what it's going to do to you and your kids and your grandkids. And when we set our children before a television program and the devil, the prince of the power of the air, puts things into his mind, it's down the road that those things affect his mind. Nowadays, in this generation, we're seeing the effects of what the preachers warned about 25 years ago when they said, stop letting your kids play those violent video games. Now we see that playing out. They said it's going to play out. They're going to start acting that stuff out. Guess what happened? If only we'd have listened to the old timers. If only we'd have listened to the counsel of the old men. We see his folly. In James 4, 17, the Bible tells us, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When we know we ought not to do things or we ought not to uh, put those things before us, even though we think it's something small or it's a small sin or whatever it is, we're making provision and making a way for the devil to get in. And that's our folly. That's our folly. Our up and down in Christianity is a result of, of letting little things in that are going to sting us a little bit longer and a little bit longer than we ever intended. Sin always takes us further than we ever intended to go. Number three, or letter C, if you will, by introduction, I want you to notice now he's going to make some good choices briefly, or, or excuse me, a bad choice here, and then he's going to make a good choice. Look at chapter number 11, the very first verse here in chapter 11. The Bible tells us this. We see his forces. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered the house of Judah 
and Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. He decided that he was going to do whatever it took to make his kingdom bigger and more powerful. He'd do anything to get, to get them all brought back together. He gathers 180,000 men to take all of Israel and Judah to make them one again. He is ready to fight, the Bible says, against his brethren. And then in verse number 4, the Lord speaks to him and says, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. You know what happens when you get sin in your life? You know what begins to take place in a church when, some, when one of the members of the church gets into a sin that they think nobody knows about? They begin to fight against their brethren. Here, Rehoboam is going to put together mass forces and he's going to begin uh, the process of gathering them together. He's going down to fight his own brethren to take them over and to bring them in subjection of his rule and his kingdom. Can I tell you this morning, that's exactly what sin will do to you. It's going to cause you to be divided against your family. It's going to be divided. You're going to be divided against your church, the, the, your friends, your co-workers. God uh, does not design it that way. He's not the author of confusion. When confusion enters into the scene, you can mark it down. It's a result of sin and Satan working through you. What Rehoboam here is doing is he is stepping up to try to do things his way, not in God's power, forgetting that it's God who put him in power. Because God puts all uh, kings and authorities, he puts them all in place. But instead, he's going to try to do it his way. He begins with his forces. Proverbs 16, this is written by his daddy. Proverbs 16, verse 6 through 10, or verse 9, the Bible says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with right, without right. A man's heart divideth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. It's very clear to me that his forces that are gathered here are not for the purpose of fighting against evil as we would do in the churches where getting souls saved. We went, now we train them in the Sunday school hour through the preaching. We're training to go out there and to compel the lost to come in fighting against the forces of evil. But he's gathering his forces to work against his own people, to hurt his own people. And every time we commit sin, we're committing sin that hurts us and leaves marks in our lives, but your sin affects someone else. And it may affect more than some, one other person. Lot's sins affected multitudes of people. Abraham, uh, in, in, in having the, the, the child before Sarah had the child and, and they thought they were doing right, his effects are still today the Muslim people warring against Israel. The sin that's in your life is a, is a reason for the roller coaster effect. It's those little things in life that are affecting people down through the way. But you know, he did the right thing. When the Lord speaks in verse number four and he says, listen, he says, don't go down and fight your brethren. I'm thankful this morning for those times when God constrained me and I was about to go off uh, the, uh, somewhere I didn't need to go or do something I didn't need to do in my life, a choice that uh, didn't need to be made and though I might have justified it in my own mind, I'm glad that God restrained me and I didn't go down and do any kind of destruction. Instead, he, he does what he says. The Bible tells us, I believe it's in verse number five, or verse number four goes on to say, uh, and they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Now, it, it could be justified. You might say it was justified by Rehoboam because the truth of the matter is, if you continue on reading, Jeroboam's doing some wicked stuff down there. Uh, he's, he's leading some pretty wicked people down there. But God says, that those are your brethren. You may not agree with them. They may be not doing things the way you do it, but don't go into war with them. One thing I, I suppose I've learned uh, in this study here is God's taught me is I just uh, enjoy a good, uh, good Baptist fight, you know, you're calling out preachers that are preaching wrong things. But sometimes I, I get on the wrong preachers that don't do things the right way that I think is the right way. And, and, and it may be that they're doing it the wrong way. God showed me that I, sometimes I just need to keep my mouth shut. Let him, let him do what he's doing over there. And uh, you, nobody needs to say amen there. I'm going to move on to the next point. No, you're right. You're right, Miss Sue. That was a good amen. <laughs> Number, yes, amen. <laughs> Number four. Mess me up here. Where are we at? Number four, verse 11, chapter 11. The Bible says, 
And this is where Rehoboam begins doing the right thing now. He's heading the right direction. It says, and he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victual and of oil and wine. Now he's going to do the right thing. Now he's using his head. Now he's preparing for the things ahead, the battle ahead, and he's going to fortify what he does already have. God's already given him what he needs, and it's time to utilize what he needs. And he knows that the devil is going to come. He knows that the enemy is going to come in his situation. We know the devil's coming against us. He knows that these enemies are coming, so he needs to fortify what he has. And he's going to make sure that all the cities are well prepared. I see a picture of us. We need to, in the personal level, we need to fortify ourselves. We need to make sure that we're strong in all points, not just one area. Some Christians are satisfied with just having an understanding or memorizing scripture no friend you need to be satisfied with nothing you're continually learning the word of God being strengthened by preaching never missing a service Dr. Robertson used to say uh, it takes three to thrive Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night that's what it's going to take to overcome the enemy to resist the devil so he does flee from us here Rehoboam is going to strengthen and fortify his cities. He's going to make himself right. You can apply that to the family. We need to strengthen the family. We need to strengthen our, not just ourselves and guard ourselves, but we need to help strengthen our spouses. We need to strengthen our children. We need to make sure that all areas are well supplied, well stocked, and ready for the battle that's ahead. There's always a battle. We're in a spiritual batter, battle day in and day out. He's fortifying. He's doing the right thing. He's heading in the right direction. Psalms 51.10, his granddaddy David, he, he, he fortified himself. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's making sure that he was ready for the battles ahead. David was a man after God's own heart because David was always searching himself and asking God to strengthen himself. And if we can learn anything here, and, and Rehoboam has certainly learned one thing, that David taught him and that Solomon, his, his daddy, taught him was that, hey, you're going to need, you're gonna need to be prepared to, for the battles ahead, for the fight ahead, for the things that are going to come against you and destroy you. You be prepared. Set up guard. Be watch. Be on watch. Be ready for the, 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 the war that's ahead of you. His daddy wrote this in Proverbs. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence. I'm going to ask you this morning, are you keeping your heart with all diligence? I mean, guard the thought. What are your thoughts? Your heart's where your thinking is. That's the, your mind, your, the seat of your emotions. Your, you, 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 the area where you really get down and start thinking about things. You ever find yourself thinking about things you have no business? Now, what I can't get over sometimes is, well, I'll get down and I'm just so serious with God and I'm just seeking his face and all of a sudden something bizarre is in my mind. I mean, one moment I'm, I'm praying out to God and seeking him and the next moment I'm thinking about something, maybe it's even wicked. And I just don't understand that. Guard our heart. Keep it. You know how you keep it? You close the door and you lock it and don't let nothing come into it. See, the problem where we struggle and the reason we have these ups and downs and ups and downs in the Christian life is because we think we got it. And we come over here and, you know, it's not that bad. I know I'll turn it off for the commercials. But we begin to watch it and it doesn't take long where the cursing comes across. That used to be the way with the ball games. I used to watch ball games a few years ago before I got rid of my television. I told you I love sports and I'd be watching the ball game, and it used to be I knew the commercials were bad. So I'd turn them off for the commercials. As soon as the game's over, you know, it comes that break, cut them off. Well, then they started miking up the players. And they can't help what the players are going to say, right? It's live TV. Well, guess what? It's cursing. You say, well, that's no big deal. You get that out in public. Well, you, you might go through a store and hear some cursing. Nowadays, you're going to hear some cursing. But you know what I decided? That if I could close that door and get over the fact that it, it affected me because I love sports. I mean, there was nobody that loved sports more than me. I played them all the time. I mean, I competed every chance I got. I was out there. I, I'd love to go out there and play against the little kids because I could whoop up on them, throw it down, and slam dunk the ball. I mean, I love sports. But I had to shut that down because I had to close another door that the devil could come through in my mind. Guess what I've done it with shopping too. Found out that that you can order everything online and pull up and they'll load the back of your car at Walmart. My wife's been utilizing that. She sends me over, I pick it all up. She, she won out of that deal because she doesn't have to go grocery shopping no more. 
I don't have to hear the cursing anymore. Closing every door possible is what I'm saying. That's what his daddy said. This is what Solomon, the wisest man ever lived. This is what he's telling his son. He's telling us, keep thy heart with all diligence. That means it's not just, you know, closing the door. It's locking that door and making sure the shades are pulled down so none of of the devil can come and looking for ways to get in. Keep in your heart with all diligence. Every avenue. Psalm 73, 26. My heart of my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We need to guard ourselves. He fortified. He's doing the right thing here. He's doing some fortification. It would have been good if he had done it before. But he's starting down the right way. If only he would have listened to his, his father's counsel that's found in, in Proverbs 7.25 when Solomon wrote this, Let not thine heart decline unto her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Solomon figured that a long time ago. Don't follow your heart. That's, the, that's what the world tells you today. That's what, they, hey, whatever makes you happy. The YOLO was the, the big saying not too long back. You only live once. Just do whatever it makes you happy. Yeah, see where that gets you. A bunch of heartache and scars that last you a lifetime. I can testify to it. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but it's going to hurt you a long way down the road. How can you fortify yourself, you ask? Well, according to God in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5, the Bible tells us, Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, uh, conspicuous. I messed that word up the other night. What's the word? Help me out here. I'm messing it all up. I could say that word a thousand times in my office, and then when I'm standing up here, my tongue's gone. Anyways, the Bible says mortify. We'll leave it on paper. Mortify your deeds. Mortify your members. Mortify your members. How do you guard yourself? How do you fortify? Die daily. You want to overcome that up and down of Christianity? You want to have the power of God in your life day in and day out, not just Monday or not just Tuesday or not just half the week. I'm talking about experiencing the power of God in your heart. I've been jumping all over Brant uh, here lately just telling every time it snows, it's the, God says he wants to give us the desires of your heart. And every time he doesn't get something, he says, well, I thought God gives you the desires of your heart. I said, brother, you got sin in your life. I don't know what to tell you. And, and so this morning he comes to me. He, he's out here taking care of the, the sidewalks. Thank you, brother, for doing that. Uh, he get them all cleared off and salted. And, and, and he said, you know what? We need, to get a, we need to find someone in the church who's got a snowblower that lets us bring it up here. We just blow the snow out of the way. Well, sure enough, Don Crow comes in. He says, listen, I got a snowblower over here I've been using. If y'all need to use it sometime, you'll get experience. So Brant got to experience God gave him the desires of his heart. Amen? Now, that's a little example, but can I tell you this? You can live in victory day in and day out. I've told you guys, I've shared with you the times uh, when I've given to God, and I told you the story where I pulled that book out of the bookstore and opened it up, and right there in the front cover is uh, crisp dollar bills never folded, exactly what I had put in the offering plate the night before by faith, trusting God would provide a need. That's knowing that God will take you. That's the victorious Christian life day in and day out. There's no roller coaster to this thing. God's going to take you just where you need to go when you need to go. You simply have to have faith and trust him. He's fortifying. He's building up. We can trust God because we know this. Furthermore, in according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 1 through 4, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel and sanctification and honor. You want to experience the power of God. Quit sinning and walk in the power of God by reading his word and trusting his word and memorizing his word and meditating on it day and night. That's how you have victory in in this world, living a victorious Christian life. For the sake of time, I'm going to stop on this final point in the introduction. I'm introducing you to this. That's what that introduction means. So tonight we'll pick up. I expected we'd get about this point anyway. But I want you to notice his forsaking is forsaking. Turn your attention back, if you would, uh, to chapter number 10 and verse number 8. The Bible says, as we've already looked here, he took his counsel from the old men in verse number 6, but, and then in verse number 8 it says, but he forsook the counsel where, which the old men gave him. Then verse number 13, and the king answered them roughly, and the king Rehoboam 
And it says it again. This is three days later, he says it again. He forsook the counsel of the old men. He had three days between verse number 8 and verse number uh, uh, 13 to get it right. He had three days to think about his mistake before, and now that he's heard both the old men and the young men, he had three days to sit down with God and let God show him some things, to give him some of that wisdom that he promised he'd give him. But three days comes and goes, and he's decided, boy, it sounds better for me to answer it this way. Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Verse number 12, uh, chapter number 12, verse number 1, we find the third time this word forsook is mentioned concerning Rehoboam. And it says it this way. Now, it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord. So he went from forsaking the old men's counsel to now he's forsaking the word of God. And the Bible says... And all Israel with him. What's concerning to me is that last part. I mean, I could already see in Rehoboam's life that as he's turned away from God and he's forsaking the wisdom of these old timers that have walked life's paths and have seen the great things that Solomon did and, 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 and no doubt heard the stories of David, his father, and their time as his counselors. He, I can already see Rehoboam's progression down the wrong path. I see him heading down. I can understand when he forsook them that he ends up forsaking the law of the Lord. But it's the last part of verse 12 that concerns me. Because it ought to concern you. Because what it says is that all Israel with him. And you want to know what's included with all Israel with him? Those old men. That's part of the all. You see what happened was in his pride and contention, Those old men gave him good advice. But because he was king and maybe because they got tired of fighting with him, he began to lead them down a wrong path. And the sin in your life, those things in your life that maybe it's not even necessarily started off as a sin, but maybe it's just a bad choice. You're you're putting yourself in a precarious situation. You ought not to be in that spot. You ought not to be hanging out with that person because you know the wise counselors, your parents and grandparents told you, hey, you are who you hang out with. You knew that going along, but you decided you're going to hang out with them. And it wasn't a sin at first. But as that progressed down the way, what happens is you're leading somebody. And you're going to lead those people to do what you could have never imagined. If you'd asked Rehoboam on day one, would you ever lead people away from the God of Israel? There was no doubt in my mind. He'd get him emphatic. There's no possible way. You know every church that's turned their back on the old past? and gone into some new liberal thing, and most of them, you can look back now, and you just see how far they went. And it wasn't never fast. It was slow. It was a slow, progressive, declining deterioration because what happened was they they had no intention of leading anyone away from the Lord. They were trying a new way to find ways to bring it in. They forgot what the old timer said, what, what the writers of the Bible said, what God said himself, that unless the Lord built it, they labor in vain. They forget those things. And they begin to follow. And those sins in your life, that roller coaster in your life, I can promise you this. It's going to be in your children and in your grandchildren. If you don't get the roller coaster straightened out in your life, spiritual, financial, a a business mind, a work ethic, if you don't get those roller coasters straight out in your life, you're going to pass it on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. That end of verse number one, got to me because I looked back into my life and I saw my dad, he drinks alcohol. He, he, he doesn't drink like he used to, but he used to drink a lot. And I can contribute. My choices are my choices, but I can contribute my, my willingness to run into that lifestyle so quickly because of the generational thing. And my dear friends, it is imperative this morning, before we can even step into the next portion of scripture, we must realize that our, our actions are taking other people down a trail that they don't want to end up on. Forsaking the law of the Lord is a dangerous place to be. It's a wicked place to be. 
and the destructive trail that follows. Let me show you how destructive it is and we'll close. Look at just a few, back in chapter 11, look halfway back. Verse number 15, of verse number 14. The Levites left their suburbs and their possessions down with Jeroboam. They left everything they had, all their inheritance, everything they owned, they left it there. And it says in verse number 15, uh, yeah, verse number 15, he says, he ordained him. Who is he? He's talking about Jeroboam. Jeroboam ordained him a priest, not God a priest. He ordained him some priest to do what he wanted. Look what it says. And for the devils, uh, for a priest for the high places, and for the devils and for the calves which he made. Can you imagine that God's people have now gone to a place where they're ordaining priests literally for devils? That's what the, are you in the Bible? That's where I'm at. That's what the Bible just said. He ordained priests for the devils. Boy, I can tell you that's, there's some of that going on in America today. There's some of that go, dangerous, dangerous grounds here. The Levites leave in verse number 14. They leave because of the wickedness, the departing from the old past in verse number 14, 15. What's happening in Jeroboam? Now watch this. And so when they come in verse number 16, and after them, out of all tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem. Literally, the Bible tells us that everyone who was seeking God is leaving the world, this wicked culture behind, and they're headed to Jerusalem. They are now, all God's people are now in Rehoboam's uh, uh, kingdom. He now has the best of the best. I'm talking about the people that walk with God and who are seeking, actively seeking God. Look what it says in verse number 17. Speaking about those Levites, and they strengthened, they strengthened the Levites because they arrived, because God's people comes on the scene, it strengthens the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years, Rehoboam, because he defend, he put up fortification back here, because he turned from attacking his brethren, God's going to bless that action. And for three years, God's people strengthened Rehoboam's kingdom. Now how in three years do you go from seeing the mighty power of Almighty God in your life to forsaken the law of the Lord. Talk about a roller coaster person. But perhaps tonight, without raising your hand this morning, without raising your hand, you could testify that your life's like that. One minute you're serving God. Maybe it's for a couple months. Maybe it's for a year. Maybe it's for three years. And then all of a sudden you make a dumb choice. And you're with the wrong people again. And all of a sudden everything comes crashing down. As Will comes to the piano for the invitation this morning,